So as is typical of every festive season, we've had tons of messages from elected and appointed public officials, you know, basically celebrating with Nigerians and urging Nigerians to support the government as it continues with that task of providing meaningful development for the nation. And we look at the Easter message really this time around and, you know, try to see how we can walk the talk with all of the messages coming in from Easter. And to help us with this conversation, we have joining us uh, the founder of the Funke Felix Adejumo Foundation, Reverend Mrs. Funke Felix Adejumo. Dejimo, who joins us on the morning brief this morning via Zoom. Good morning and welcome back to the program. Good morning, Bukola, Jeffrey, Kayodi, and every viewer. Happy Easter to all of you. And happy Easter to you as well. It's it's nice to have to, to see you on a different uh, platform from Instagram and Facebook where we hear all of your messages. Thank you so much for joining us once again on the program and on this special uh, celebration. And that's where we're starting with, uh, for you to remind us of the essence of the Easter season. Thank you once again. I must start by saying that Chinese television, you are doing so fantastically well. You make us to keep saying we are proudly Nigerians, proudly Africans. Well done to the management, to the staff, to the team. You all are the best. Easter, in my opinion, is the most important celebration when we talk about Christianity. Because if the Lord Jesus Christ had come, had died, who did not resurrect, then Christianity would be like just any other fanfare or religion. The fact that he died and he resurrected it's what gives us hope. So it's beyond wearing of new dresses and eating chicken and all that. It makes us know that there is life after this life because there is resurrection. So as we continue with the celebration, um, you know, the, the, there's that challenge of, you know, um, reflecting the values of the season because either it's uh, the Easter Christian message or it's the message from the other faiths, we, you know, which we're even about to celebrate. Uh, that would be the Ramadan, which would be preaching tolerance. The challenge is it hardly reflects on our daily lives. So what would be your message at this very challenging and critical point of our existence for us to live together as as one as a nation thank you very much if we look at the life that jesus christ lived we have so many lessons number one we have love love leads to religious tolerance if we understand love that you are not superior to me neither am i superior to you in Job chapter number 12 and verse number 3, and Job chapter 13 verse 2, the Bible says, what you know, I know, I am not inferior to you. Jesus Christ brought love. And that makes us understand that we must love. You cannot be killing me because you want me to do your religion. You cannot be demeaning me because you want, if you kill me, so what will I, what will you preach to me? So that's the first thing, religious tolerance. In some families, we have Christians, we have Muslims, we have Buddhists, we have, you know, the first law, well, let me speak as, as a law student now, in international humanitarian law, one of the main principles is humanity, the principle of humanity not religion. So, as we reflect on the values of Christmas, we must understand this. Number two is focus. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, he focused on the reason why he came. You cannot be here and there and there and there and there and become successful. We must understand that this is a major lesson that Easter teaches us. Focus, focus focus. Number three is forgiveness. 
you cannot continue to celebrate the anniversary of people's wrongs. Who is perfect, by the way? All of us have reasons to be maybe embarrassed and say, oh, I wish I didn't say that. I wish I didn't do that. If God continues to remind us of our sins, you know, we won't all be here. So forgiveness is one of the values. Also, we must understand that vengeance is not right. You cannot say because somebody did this, you'll be waiting for the time to, you know, take vengeance. It's going to kill everybody. This is it. If God were to, was to mark iniquity, none of us will be able to stand. And let me say one more. We must begin to see the good in other people that are different from us. We may be different. It does not mean that you are inferior or superior. Mm. This we cannot say too much. Let's understand this difference. And the fact that somebody does not have your view, just like we have that, those four um, blind people that were told to touch the elephant. You touch different parts of the elephant. That's the same thing with life. So please understand this. It will help us as leaders and as the led to know that we will always have differences. But we must, like you all have been saying, have a united state of Nigeria. Thank you. Uh, let, let's dig deep uh, further in that particular narrative you just put out, Madam, on the issue of love. Uh, so why is it that it's quite difficult for people to rightly interpret the intent of the, uh, of the deity they subscribe to, in this case, case the Christian faith, uh, because we have several religions in Nigeria, and everybody seems to have their own version and understanding, which is the reason for some of the outcome we see that we follow by each other about. Thank you, Jeffrey. I believe that it begins from the home, the family. We have four kinds of parents. Absentee parents. They are there, but they are not there. Some are not even there at all, looking for money everywhere at the detriment of their families. We have abusive parents. Any little thing, that's both. You are this, you are an idiot, you are stupid, you are silly. Number three, we have permissive parents. Anything goes, it doesn't matter, he's a child. And we find that also in the Bible about a, a pastor called Eli. And then we have participatory parents. All the leaders we have, all the people we have in authority, journalists, pastors, you know, civil servants, business people, grew up and went raised in homes. If we start going back to the values of families, where the children are raised, where the father does not say, it's all go to your mommy, it's just your mommy. Where we have participatory parenting and we begin to raise these children together and we prepare them, they are going to become better leaders, better citizens, and all that. For instance, Jeffrey, my husband and I are starting a school, a boys college and a girls college. And it's not just about teaching physics and chemistry and maths. We want to raise them apart from these subjects on how to be a man, how to be a husband, how to be a father, how to be a profitable citizen, how to be a girl, how to understand that being a girl does not make you inferior. If we begin to do this, it's going to help us when the child does not see the father slap the mother, when the child does not see the mother disrespect the father, whether you like it or not, he or she is going to grow up with these values. And by the time he or she gets to, you know, circles of influence, places of authority, it's going to flow down. Psalm 133, it starts from the head. It's going to flow down. If we begin to do this, I bet you it's a matter of time. Mm. Let's be present in our children's lives. Mm. I'm so sorry to say that generations ahead might have missed it, but it's never too late. Let's start. Let's have the number of children we can raise mm. and let both father and the mother. 
be involved in raising these kids and preparing them for tomorrow. Uh, absolutely something to reflect, not just reflect on, but act on it. But, I mean, why would I yield or begin to reap the fruits of this seed some years to come when these children grow up? I mean, we're currently in a situation where there is mutual uh, suspicion amongst ethnicities, people, and I think that's been one of our major challenges as a nation. And that's why the FDB boss was calling for United States of Nigeria, because it looks like everybody's suspicious of the other. This one is trying to, you know, cheat me, so I'm going to pull the person down. I won't let you achieve what you want to achieve. And we've been at this for years and decades. So I'll bring this to your forte, which is relationship and marriage. If you are to counsel us as Nigerians, we're seated right in front of you, and you're doing your thing. And one of our major issues is mutual suspicion. I don't trust this person. Just like a man would tell you that I don't trust my wife or vice versa. You're seated right in front of us as Nigerians. What would be your prescription for us as a way of marriage counseling or relationship counseling in this case? Thank you so much, Kayodi. There are three things I'm going to say. Number one is the picture of destiny. And I want to break it down. What is the picture that you have of your family, of your relationship, of a nation, of your continents? The picture of destiny, the imagination, it must be clear. Just like <laughs> when I'm watching uh, Chinese television, maybe soccer, and there is no goalposts. It will just be a waste of time. So that's the first thing. The picture of destiny. The picture of what you want. Now, this sounds funny, but when my husband was, and I were dating, one day he came visiting, and he gave me a pen and a paper, and he said to me, write what you see in the future and what you want. And he picked his own and wrote. By the time we began to compare, I noticed something. He wrote even the kind of flowers he wants us to plant in the house. 40 years down the line, I see these flowers. It's scriptural. The book of Genesis chapter 6, God said, let's come down and scatter these things because nothing will be restrained to them that they have begun to think or imagine. So the picture of destiny, what do you see? What do you want as a man, as a woman? as a nation, as leaders, as the lead. Number two is the company of destiny. Who has your ears? Because you smell like the company you keep. Your friend is the prophecy of your future. You cannot have a great home, for instance, a great family life, if all you hear is, don't allow the man who eh, give it to him. If he slaps you, slap him back. How can he give you 50,000? Can you imagine? You cannot. So who has your ears? Who is in your company? And we need to be careful of three groups of people. Number one, expired mentors. Number two, jealous colleagues. Number three, parasitic proteges. These people won't take you anywhere. That's the second thing. The first thing is the picture of destiny. The second thing is the company of destiny. And the third thing is the discipline of destiny. And this has to do with our homes, with our families, with our nation, with people in authority, with every one of us. You cannot afford not to pay the price. <laughs> I've been married 40 years. Ask my husband, ask me. It's not been a bed of roses. We have our issues. No marriage is perfect. We don't have a perfect marriage, but we have a great one by reason of God's grace and then the discipline of destiny. The discipline, which is one of the things lacking in Nigeria. The discipline. And I believe that as God begins to give us great leaders, Nigerians are easy to lead. I'm telling you. How do I say this and why do I say this? When you go abroad, it will shock you that Nigerians will follow. They won't break the light, quote and unquote. When the light says stop, they stop. When they say you cannot cross or else you pay 1,000 pounds. There was, there was a time when we were told to kill. 
I think it was Idiagwa and all that that were in us that was enough at that time. We were killed. We killed. You tell us to do this, we do. The discipline of destiny, that is a major pain. When you begin to see the good in other people, when you don't have a PhD in evil, operation, pull him down. When you don't pull people down with your mouth or with your fingers on the internet, when all you are looking for is not people's mistakes, this person may make mistakes, but let's put it on the scale. This person, has he or she blessed us? Is this person impactful? This person is a human being, B-E-I-N-G, not a human being. You know, past participle, B-E-E-N. None of us is a human being. So why is it that it's always, you're always looking for the mistakes of other people? Why is Jeffrey like that? Why is Kaya Day's tie like that? Why is Bukola shaking her head? You know, what about the impact they have made? When we begin to understand the discipline, we put it there. You can't be a man and be sleeping around. You can't be a woman and be dishonoring everybody. Talking to your in-laws anyhow. <laughs> of course, you know what I'm talking about now. And all that. So, I believe these three things are important. The picture that we want to see. And there must be clarity about that. The company. And then the discipline. Thank you. Ah. Uh deep profound and uh, coming from you i guess some of us will be looking through our list for parasitic proteges and uh, what's the other expired one now expired mentors expired mentors <laughs> so that we can have that you know uh, <laughs> yeah that uh, envision that destiny and actualize that disciplined destiny but as we dig deeper now you know as jeffrey would always say to the difficult part of the conversation earlier on you know, on our bulletins, we had that admonition from Reverend Adegwite, who said, everyone, all hands must be on deck. So either the elected and appointed leaders, the followers, the children in the schools, even the men in the cassocks. And uh, that's where I want to draw from the lesson of uh, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, whose sacrifice we're celebrating on Easter today. He lived an austere lifestyle. You know, but what we see more often than not is a little less and less of that example reflected in the lives of, quote and unquote, the men of God. As a matter of fact, in recent times, some videos have shown on social media, you know, where um, their followers are falling over their, themselves, you know, to, to greet uh, their men of God, quote and unquote, this worship and adoration of the lifestyles of men of God, for which, you know, sometimes uh, Nigerians do not spare them for owning um, uh, aircrafts. So what would your stance be on this, particularly in emulating the kind of life that Jesus lived while he was on the earth? Thank you, Bukola. I'm going to try and bring a balance to this issue. Number one, the fact that you are a servant of God does not mean you should be wretched. My husband and I have been in business before we got into ministry. And I believe that's the story of some men of God. As we speak, my husband and I are still in business, full-time business and full-time ministry. We do not draw salary from the church. It is a decision. And it does not mean that every pastor or every reverend or bishop should follow that. We just decided. My husband told me that that's how we're going to live our lives. My husband will be 70 in a few weeks' time. He still goes to the farm. If you go to our farm, you will see eggs, chicken, this, that, you know, we plant and all that. And you know some of the things I do too. We have different things. That's what we do. And we are one of the best givers in the ministry. So sometimes we don't say these things because we just feel it's okay. God sees it. But that's the reality on ground. So if a man of God is blessed and he buys a jet, if I tell you my schedule, you will, you will be wondering how do I go. If, the, if he buys a jet, 
it may not necessarily mean that it's from the offering. But I don't want to own a jet when the people around me cannot afford a meal. The book of Hebrews chapter 5 tells us, beginning from verse 1 to 4, any high priest that cannot be touched is a low priest. Because he says, if Jesus Christ, our high priest, can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Last week, for instance, Mazun and I put, and that's what we do regularly, food baskets. Recently, we just empowered 100 women, widows, you know, and all that. We don't put all this on social media. And I'm sure that people that are bigger than us in ministry, they do this regularly. So that's one balance. The other one is, if you are truly a servant of God, and people must be pushed and beaten and just because just because you are entering the service or just because you are around Bukola, Jeffrey, Kayode, if you have the time or you send someone, come to our church. We tell the ushers, now, if you have to push away these people, who are we pastoring? If I'm not free to move and follow, the, the church just closed, closed now, and then we are all going out, and you have to be pushing and pushing them. For what? That's silly. That's not right at all. And that's not godly. There are churches that when the, the owner of the church, Jesus himself, enters, nobody knows. But when the geo enters, hey, hey, everybody, ah, blah, 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 blah. that's not, that's not Christianity. And not being judgmental, but, but this is it. And let me say this. God is God. He gave us brain. Inside this call, each of us has between 10 and 14 billion cells. It's not only to wear weak or cap, it is to think. So why do you go to a place where you are being treated as an animal? With all the book that you know, and then somebody will mix Sprite for you and tell you to drink it. Where's your brain? Your brain is what God gave to you so that you will not keep disturbing him. Why? How? I still can't wrap my head around this. And then you, you, you lie down a pastor, a fellow human being is ramping on you in the name of anointing. Are you serious? Are you kidding me? And then you say it's because of... That's not spirituality. That's stupidity. And I don't subscribe to that at all. So let's get the balance. A man of God can prosper, but please, if you're a man of God, you're a high priest, can you please touch others and let them be able to touch you and help them? At the same time, if a man of God has this with clean money, it is nothing, there's nothing wrong with it, in my opinion. Just the balance, the balance. And I cannot say that enough, the balance. We should not begin to think that, you know, um, celebrating a private jet is an, is an achievement. No. Abroad, they have it. Pastors have it. It's easy for movements. I've been to churches where, you know, there's a Baptist church I attend when I'm in Houston. The man of God has to be here for service, there, second service, you know. It's just, it's, it's just like your car. It's for easy movement. But you know us in Africa, we worship anything. And I don't think that is right. All right. Thank you. That's my... Yeah. The, the, the reason that conversation, that question is quite, is quite important because for, for the clerics to be able to have influence on the people and the nation a lot of housekeeping has to be done and i know that you don't shy away from some of these assertions and statements but maybe again you need to help us bring some clarity on some of the things that has gotten you some flax um which has to do with the issue of seed sowing in relation to the finished work of christ and i know that there was a time it was a big issue and sometimes we realize that when people are not allowed to explain the context 
uh, and just take it from the headlines, it becomes controversial and people are misunderstood. So perhaps it's an opportunity. I know you've spoken about issue of money and seed sowing. I know you've spoken about uh, issues of relationship, but the seed sowing part and the finished work of Christ has been a controversy for a long time, not just around what you said. Maybe you provide some clarity. Thank you very much. It is a biblical principle. Until tomorrow, in the church, we will sow seeds. I'm telling you, we can never shy away from that. Even Muslims, they sow. So I wonder why Christians criticize pastors for asking people to sow seeds. When, depending on the pastor, for instance, when I lead people to sow seeds, one cover does not mistakenly find its way to my pocket. For what? Rather, I will sow my own. Genesis 8.22, while the earth remains, the earth still remains. Seed, time, harvest. Luke chapter number 8, some women were committed to sowing seeds to Jesus' ministry. Romans chapter 16, Paul was analyzing and eulogizing and thanking some people that were committed. So I'm on Zoom now. <laughs> if I have to do this every Sunday in church, I have to spend money. If I don't have a business, the church will provide it. In the Anglican setting and some of these Orthodox churches, the church builds the vicarage. There's nothing wrong with it. You take care of your pastor. If your pastor works with Chevron, will Chevron not take care of the pastor? We are talking about excesses. There is nothing wrong when you sow your seed as a person. You cannot be prosperous without some principles, hard work, you know, doing business or having a job and giving. It's not only the church we give to when we, when we sow seeds. It's not only the church. So people have taken it out of context. They've cut tapes. You know, they don't know what, for instance, a person like me have been criticized. <laughs> of course, you know, and then you just cut it. You don't know what led to that. You don't even, they don't even put how much I gave. Where I gave a thousand pounds, they will not show that one. They will just show the way and where I told the people to give. And then you, you send it around. It's funny. But it's, it's part of the package. You know, elevated people will always be criticized by frustrated people. So if you don't have the God to show us the full video, but your intention is to show that, oh, you see, I've been, in, I've been a pastor's wife for 30 something years. You don't expect me not to, not to lead people to give offering or to sources. And then you don't cut it and cut it and cut it. That's, that's the, I don't have answers for that. But for seed sowing, Jeffrey, Buki, Kyle, there is nothing wrong with it. It is scriptural. But I don't believe in making people feel bad if they can't afford to sow. If you don't pay your tithe, you are going to hell. It's not scriptural. If you don't give a thousand naira, you are, no, it's not scriptural. We give because we love God. Whether you give or you don't give, you are a Christian. You will make heaven. Right. So there's no twisting of hands in this matter. As well, a balance. Well, Reverend, maybe there needs to be a master class from you on how you handle controversies. You seem to have a thick skin. It looks like week in, week out, there's always something about you trending on social media, a statement you made, cut out. And, you know, a lot of people just have a go at you. But you made a statement that elevated people are, are criticized by frustrated people. Frustrated. I, I imagine that will trend as well. So <laughs> <laughs> I wish you the best on this one. But, but as we wind down, maybe you can give us an insight how you handle uh, you know, some of those trends. When you see another headline and you go, oh, God, they are coming at me again. Maybe you can tell us how you handle it. What is your go-to when that happens? And also, maybe we can wind down on this conversation around young people because uh, it looks like a lot of them are getting uh, you know, disinterested, not just in governance now, but even in religion. You know, they've seen a lot of things. They've seen how their parents are uh, fed, go into, you know, religious houses time and again, and they look at their lives and they're like, I, no, I don't want my life to be like this. Yes, they are shining examples, but there are a lot of young people that will say, you know what, I don't want to have anything to do with this. Let me just live my life, do my thing, and then exit. So <laughs> it's kind of like a two-pronged question, basically, how you handle the controversies and all and to young Nigerians, young people generally. Thank you very much. Winston Churchill said, 
when you are focused, you don't have time to throw stones at every dog that barks. I have come to understand that it is part of the package. Once you get to the top, you will become a topic. So I don't read these things, honestly. But when my media team says, oh, mommy, or oh, FFA, this is good, I just laugh. And I laugh that from my husband. He's been in leadership for almost 50 years. So I watch him the way he responds, and I laugh. At first, it wasn't laughable, but now I think I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> so I love. And then it's sad, the other question, it's sad, it's heartbreaking to see young people feeling this way, becoming not only disappointed, but disillusioned. And I like to say that when you say things like this, it shows the depravity of the human being. To let you know that your, your parents or people in leadership, in government, in church, they, they are not perfect, they are human. So rather than being disappointed or disillusioned, why don't you flip it and say, okay, I'm learning how not to do it. If this is what they did and I don't like it, or I think it's not right, let me show my own next generation because we're dealing with three generations. The structured generation, which is generation of our parents, and my generation, people like me in their 60s, were dealing with the handover generation, which is not properly my generation. And they were dealing with the transition generation, which is in the generation Coyote spoke about, the generation of my children and grandchildren. These three generations, structured, transition, handover and transition. This transition generation will one day become the handover generation. So they better start learning now that, okay, our parents, they did this, they did that. They didn't do it well. So let me be an improvement so that when I become the handover generation and my children become the transition generation, they will be able to do it better. Just like we look at the African culture, for instance. There are some things that are fantastic in the African culture, but there are some things that we don't like, we don't want, barbaric killing of twins, circumcising a female, you know, a woman cannot ask for sex, and this, that, and then we say, no, 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 no. Our forefathers, the structured generation did us. Let's take it out. So I believe that every generation should be an improvement. They should not give up, please. We have bad pastors, bad imam, bad journalists, bad soldiers, bad police, because you are first a human being before you are any other thing. They should just put on that spectacle and see us from that perspective. Thank you. Wow, wow. What what a conversation. And that's a fine place to leave it. We must not lose our humanity, even as we strive to reflect the values and the essence of the season. We'd like to thank you so much. Of course, there are other areas that we didn't touch. We're going to ask you about your own personal story and, you know, every other uh, issue that re that's relating to Easter, but we'll look forward to having you on another edition of the program. Thank you so much, ma'am. We've been speaking with the founder of the Funke Felix Adejumo Foundation, Reverend Mrs. Funke Felix Adejumo. Thank you so much for your time on the program. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Bye. And from Easter now, we shift gears to politics. What's the way forward for the third force, the Labour Party? We'll have those questions answered right after this break. Join us again on The Morning Brief. We'll be right back.